Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar, Network Your Way to Success, presented by Roy Ginsberg. My name is Stephanie Phelan and I'm a Marketing Manager at MyCase and I will be your host today. I'd like to give you a few tips about participating in GoToWebinar. The webinar control panel is on the right hand side of your screen. This is where you may submit questions and where you'll see polls come up throughout the presentation. Please submit questions during the presentation and don't hold off until the very end. We save all of your questions until the end of the presentation. That's when Roy will answer what we've collected throughout the webinar. Also, please note that these slides and the recording will be available by end of day tomorrow on the MyCase blog, and it will also be emailed to all registrants. Also, the Twitter hashtag to follow the conversation is hashtag networking success. Today's webinar is hosted by MyCase, so before we jump into things, I'd like to give you a quick overview. My case is a web-based law practice management software that takes care of your daily practice requirements for calendaring, contact management, document management, and templates, time and billing, client communication, custom workflows, and more in one solution at an affordable price. My case is priced for solo and small firms at just $39 a month per attorney and $29 a month per paralegal or support staff. We also offer MyCase websites for our customers. The cost to set up and build your website is only $500, and then there's a $50 per month maintenance fee. We use a modern professional design built for your firm. The websites contain social media and blog integration, and best of all, complete integration with MyCase practice management software. Now you and your customers can log into MyCase directly from your website. Last but not least, we enjoy hosting educational events for professionals in the legal industry, and that is why we're all here today. So let me tell you a little bit about our presenter. Roy Ginsberg is a pioneer in the arena of lawyer coaching. When Roy began more than 10 years ago, professional coaching for attorneys was practically unheard of. Now Roy is viewed as a leader in the field. After 30 years of practicing law, he currently runs a successful solo practice in the field of legal marketing ethics in addition to his lawyer coaching. Roy knows the challenges attorneys face and he knows what works best to manage a legal practice. He's not the kind of guy who will tell you what you want to hear, he will tell you what you need to hear. Today he will be teaching us about the importance of networking. Thank you so much for being with us, Roy. I will let you take it from here. All right, thank you very much, Stephanie. I want to welcome everybody to attending uh, today's uh, program. Just to give you an idea of what I'll be covering in the, within the next hour or so, uh, you'll learn about why a lot of people don't like uh, to network. Uh, we'll talk about who to network with, how to network. I will spend actually a few minutes on the solicitation rules because inevitably when people are doing some networking, they uh, want to ask for the business and uh, I will tell you that sometimes it's really unethical in most states to ask for business under certain circumstances. So we'll spend a few minutes about that. Uh, to also talk about how to work a room. Uh, I know a lot of lawyers uh, feel very un un uneasy. Uh, I'll provide a variety of tips there to help you figure out a way to do that in a more comfortable way than you're probably doing it now. And then I'll conclude with a few remarks about uh, you know, social networking. My goal is when we're done uh, in about 45, 50 minutes or so when I'm done with my portion of the presentation and that no one feels like these lawyers here in this cartoon, that you are all lawyered up with no place to go. My goal is to have you with a place to, to go. Okay, if you, now you're looking at your screen, you can see a picture. Uh, some of you, especially if you're a political junkie, know that that person is James Carville. And uh, the reason why uh, many of you know who he is is that he achieved his reputation back in 1992 when he ran a Clinton's campaign uh, for the presidency, the successful campaign. And those of you, again, if you're a political junkie, remember that he had a slogan for the campaign, and that slogan was, it's the relation. It's the, I'm sorry, it's the economy, stupid. Well, for purposes of the presentation, I paraphrase Mr. Carville to it's the relationship, stupid. We are in a relationship-based profession, business, whatever you want to call it. I won't get quibble about which you think it is. But in any event, it is entirely based on relationships. And the most successful lawyers tend to have uh, created and developed many relationships with uh, clients as well as referral sources. And in order to do that, you got to get out of the office. Uh, a lot of lawyers, and I've met quite a few over my career, 
uh, they somehow think, hey, I'm smart. I graduated from a really good law school. I graduated at the top of my class. Everybody should know that I'm a great lawyer, so the phone should ring. Well, no one's going to know if you're a great lawyer unless you're out there telling people that it's in some way, shape, or form that you are a great lawyer. In other words, you need to get out of the office. Uh, the phone is just not going to ring. It doesn't uh, work that way. And uh, I understand uh, we like to do polling uh, with my case when we do these uh, you know, programs. So we're going to actually have a few questions here just to make it a little more interactive uh, so I don't have to talk for the entire time. Uh, so the question number one is, what is the biggest reason why you don't network more than you presently do? Select one of the following. I don't know how to do it. I know how to do it but feel uncomfortable doing it. The third answer, I don't have enough time. And the final answer is it feels sleazy. Okay, great, Roy. Thank you for that. And everyone is voting right now. I'm going to close the polls in just a moment if you can please cast your vote, everybody. And it looks like the majority is voted. I'm going to go ahead and close the polls and share our results. Okay, so the results are 16% don't know how to do it. 34% know how to do it but feel uncomfortable doing it. And our majority, which is 41%, just don't have enough time. 8% said it feels sleazy. Uh, is that about what you expected, Roy? Uh, yeah, I suppose. And, and the good news for, well, I'll, I'll first spend a, um, a minute about the not enough time. Uh, well, you've got to make the time, and I'll have a slide about that. And my, actually, my, my primary goal here is not only that you feel like the you know, lawyer had no place to go, but I'm going to provide, I'm confident I'm going to provide you with enough tips to do all forms of networking and feel more comfortable. I have no illusions that uh, many of you are going to wake up in the morning saying, hey, I can't wait to do some whatever networking you have planned today. Uh, my goal is basically to you wake up in the morning and say, hey, I got this networking thing I'm doing. It's not so bad. You know, I, I can do it. Again, that's, that's, I, I keep my goals realistic. And again, uh, so just so you know. So let's talk about some of the other reasons uh, that uh, we've talked about here as far as what's going on. What, some, one, another reason that sometimes people don't do the networking is it feels foreign to them, which is, again, the, the uncomfortable. Uh, because when I was in law school, marketing meant, meant going to the grocery store. They certainly don't teach you anything about marketing in law school. They certainly didn't uh, 30 some odd years ago, and I know they certainly don't do it now. A lot of people, 41% said they don't have enough time. Uh, well, you've got to make the time. And if you look at the uh, billable hour thing, you see there, it, it, you know, the, it measures time in tenths of an hour for those of you who, are, who, those of you who bill by the hour. I love that clock there. Uh, but again, my theory uh, or my, what I suggest to you is, yeah, I, you know, we're all busy. I have no doubt about that. But you need to make time for it. And you, what I find a lot of lawyers that it falls short is, oh, they, they look for any excuse not to, you know, have this lunch or coffee or go to this networking event. And they say, oh, I got to get this brief out. I got to do this or I have to do that. Uh, what I'm saying, I'm not telling you to blow off the brief. Uh, what I am telling you is you've got to figure out a way to do both. Um, and, and, because again, if you want to be successful, it's not just about doing the work. Uh, it, you need to spend enough time to, again, develop the relationships. One of the answers was it feels sleazy. Uh, there's the used car salesperson. Again, what I'm, my theory uh, as far as to make you, for those of you who uh, feel sleazy, is you've got to you know, change the paradigm. What do lawyers do? What do people come to us with? They come to us with problems, irrespective of the practice area, and we help solve them. You should be proud. So in other words, what, what you need to be doing is telling people, hey, if you have a problem in this particular area, I hope you think of me. Or maybe you can refer your, your friends or family to me if you have this problem. In other words, you should be proud of what you do. And if you're not proud of what you're doing, um, then perhaps you may ought to rethink whether you should be a lawyer. Uh, or not. And finally, some people, again, this is more the uncomfortable, they don't like to schmooze. Well, as you can see here in the cartoon, trust me more, no electronic communication superhighway, no matter how vast and sophisticated will ever replace uh, the art of the schmooze. I want to talk, we talked about a little bit about the roadmap uh, for this program. Now I want to talk about the roadmap for how, what does it take to be successful in business development and also in, in networking. It's the three steps. It's actually the, the roadmap is about as simple as it gets. You got to get people, got to get to know you. Then you got to get those people to like you. Then you got to get those same people to trust you. 
that is the roadmap to successful develop, business development. Very, very, very simple three-step process. Needless to say, execution can be very problematic because if it was so easy, everybody would be a successful rainmaker. Another way of rephrasing uh, the, the, the three steps of no liking and trust is what I call the hangout theory. Uh, you got to figure out where your clients or potential referral sources uh, hang out and you figure out a way to hang out with them. And then while you're hanging out with them, you go back to the three-step process. That's how they get to know you, like you, and trust you. You can see there, for those of you uh, who may recall, Bear Bryant, he is the uh, old coach of uh, the University of Alabama football team, uh, very famous in his day. If you're going to be a successful duck hunter, you got to go where the ducks are. Time for our second poll question, true or false? The best networkers typically have a life of the party personality and are rarely introverts. Okay, great. Thank you, Roy. I have launched that poll and votes are coming in really quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up and share our results. Uh, so 35% said true. The best networkers typically have a life of the party personality. And then 65% said false. They don't believe that that's true. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what the answer is. And the answer is I believe it, it is false. Let's see. Let's, I'm having a problem. Is, there we go. Uh, it's the life of the personality. I don't, I'm not sure what her name is, but it's a myth. Um, a lot of people think, so at least most of you uh, agree with me that it is a myth. Uh, you don't need a life of the par uh, uh, party personality. You can be, in fact, one of the first people to leave the party and still be successful uh, in networking. What you need to, what's most important, now certainly are there life of the party personality people who are very successful in business development? Yes, there are many people like that. But I'll also tell you, based on my experience with the people I've worked with as a coach, plus just knowing a lot of lawyers, doing what I do, uh, there are plenty of people who are very you know, quiet and very unassuming. But what they all have in common, whether they are a life of the party or not so life of the party, is that they have two characteristics. They are patient and persistent. Uh, I like to you can see there, there's the farmer. In other words, you've got to water the plants and you got to be, uh, so you got to be persistent in making sure you, to nurture, instead of the, you know, the crops, you've got to nurture the relationships. Um, and then at the same time, you got to be patient. When you plant, you know, you're, it's essentially networking is planting a lots of seeds. And it's pretty unrealistic to think uh, that uh, all of a sudden when you want to plant a seed, the next day it's going to already be a fully blown uh, tree or bush. So again, remember the two Ps, patience and persistence. Those are what the successful rainmakers all have in common. In other words, they stick with the program. They are disciplined. And that's what's going to make you a successful networker and at the same time a successful rainmaker to bring in uh, the business. Okay, now I'm going to get into a little more the nuts and bolts of what networking is and what it isn't. Uh, a lot of people somehow think that networking is, you know, cold calling these strangers that someone says you got to get together with so-and-so, they're going to be a great referral source or a great potential client. And then somehow you're supposed to be able to do that and feel comfortable doing it. That's not my definition of networking. Why would anyone ever feel comfortable doing a cold calling? Uh, it's not a very comfortable type of activity, not to mention I don't believe it's very good. Be, you know, it's a very, very successful strategy at that. Uh, this is my definition of networking. It, basically, 90% of the networking that I would want, that I would want you to do uh, you know, as, a, as a lawyer to, you know, to bring in business is essentially one-on-one -on -one having coffee or lunch with somebody in a one-on-one -on -one setting with people you know. And I want to emphasize the fact that people you know. Uh, it is not necessarily, uh, you know, I don't want you to get together with, uh, with strangers. In other words, I want this, again, to be within your comfort zone. And another important component of networking is for mutual assistance. It's not let's get together for coffee and lunch. I want to tell you everything about how wonderful I am or how wonderful my law firm is so you can give me business. No, that's not what effective networking is. Network effect, effective networking is, hey, let's get together. Let, let's catch up and see how we can help each other out you know, professionally or personally. Again, it's really help, it, it goes both ways. It's not just how can I get business from this person. Uh, you got to go the mutual assistance route. 
there are lots of books and lots of articles and blog posts. I've written my share of blog posts about networking. Uh, and we all say the same things. And one of the, one of the uh, more popular books that was written about 10, 15 years ago by a guy named Farazi, uh, Never Eat Alone, you know, the, the currency of real networking is not greed but generosity. Again, that goes back to my uh, notion of you got to give. Uh, networking is just as much about giving and, uh, and the hope of receiving. Uh, and trust me, it works. And you talk to any successful lawyer, they will tell you who has built the business via networking uh, activities will will tell you it's all it's just as much about giving when you give, the, uh, thou shall uh, receive. All right. So the first question I'm sure you're thinking about. All right, I'm here to learn about networking. Who should I be networking with? So what I tell people is you got to create a contact list. And when I say uh, list, remember going back to what I mentioned just earlier uh, that I want you to be networking at least initially with people who you already know. I want you to feel comfortable doing. I want you to feel not only comfortable contacting these people to get together, but of course when you get together with them, I want you to feel comfortable uh, with them. So again, the 90% of the networking uh, that you'll be doing is with people that you already know. Now, then the, then the question about who do you already know? Uh, on what you see here on, on the screen in front of you are, these are just bullet points, of th just ideas to, to get you thinking of who are the people that I already know that I could add to uh, of this contact list. Certainly within your own you know, law firm if you're doing some cross-selling activities within the firm. If you, those of you working for a while had you know, previous jobs, there are some people you may want to keep in touch with. Uh, people who you know through the Bar Association, people who you've met opposing counsel, all of them I suppose that haven't been jerks and you wouldn't mind getting together with. You never know who the, how the person may be able to refer you know, business uh, to you. So another one piece of low-hanging fruit, especially for when I get asked this question uh, by younger lawyers, recent graduates, they say, I don't have any network, who should I be networking with? Well, uh, how about the alumni, people who you went to school with? Uh, especially if you went to a local, I'm sure many of you tuning in have attended a local school and so they tend to have local graduates uh, in the area that you could stay in contact with. Uh, and again, if you're hoping, and I certainly recognize your chances of getting a referral from a recent graduate that you may be as well uh, is slim to none, but I can assure you in five years you will start getting referrals and certainly within 10 to 15 you will, but you will only get referrals if you stay in some sort of contact with these people because again, they're not going to know what you're doing, what practice area you're in. Uh, so you need to, so that's again, that's an area that uh, is often very easy for people uh, to exploit as far as the relationships that they uh, have and created in law school that they can continue on and practicing. And even if you attended a school that is, <clears throat> doesn't necessarily have uh, you know a, a large number of uh, alumni in the area that that can also in some ways be uh, be more helpful. You know, for example, I had, uh, you know I am, I'm actually speaking from the Twin Cities. Needless to say, there are plenty of graduates from the University of Minnesota as well as a few other local law schools. I happen to attend the University of Wisconsin, and there's certainly a. a a large number of Wisconsin graduates here in the Twin Cities, uh, but certainly nothing of nothing coming close approaching the number of uh, you know the local schools. But with that said, I'm very you know because I'm a very active alumni and I have a lot of loyalty towards my school. If I ever get contacted for networking from somebody uh, from you know the University of Wisconsin, I'm more likely to you know go out of my way to help people. Uh, and to perhaps in, make some introductions for them or give them information. A lot of the things that networking does. Uh, so again, even if there's a small limited community uh, that you have, people are, are, are more uh, you know, more likely, I think, to uh, you know to be helpful in in the whole networking concept than if the, if your area is flooded with graduates from a, a particular school. And it also holds true for you know college too. And the same thing will hold true whether uh, they're, you know, whether there are a lot of alumni from the college as well as the law school. People have a lot of you know allegiance to that, and will uh, you know and will oftentimes you know get together with you or, or remember people from that uh, area. So that's the left hand side. The left hand side, as you will note, are more of the types of professional people that you uh, you know may know to be contacting. Uh, the right hand side, as you will see, are more of the personal. Uh, you know, perhaps some volunteer work, your church or synagogue, family, friends. Uh, you know, those of you who have young children, you meet you know meet people when you're if you're a soccer mom or a soccer dad. Uh, again, and depending on the practice area, uh, you know, those of you who represent a lot of individuals, let's say state state planning, criminal, family law, 
you know, those people that you know uh, in the community can be just as a good source of uh, potential clients as the more uh, the professional uh, types of groups. Uh, the, uh, the people that you know, you know, through those activities. Now, you know, going back to the soccer mom and soccer dad uh, uh, issue, I'm not, I'm not suggesting you go to these events and hand out, you start handing out your business cards uh, when the, when, the, when the first meeting of the parents' activities. But what I am suggesting is you may want to think about, you know, at the at the games, make it a point to sit down next to different parents at different events and just strike up some casual conversation. Uh, about and inevitably people start talking about you know what they do and again that could be a potential client a potential referral sources you also can meet people at the fitness center uh, you know there are lots of uh, places I guess and there's I'm sure I'm, I'm uh, there are some others that I you know haven't noted on this particular slide uh, but again don't you know, I think the big mistake a lot of lawyers make when they come create the contact list or when they try to focus in on what business development activity they should spend the most time on is they aim for the bullseye uh, and sometimes you're going to be disappointed when you aim for the bullseye because somehow you thought this person should be turned into a client or is going to be a great referral source and for whatever reason someone else's relationship trumps yours oftentimes without any it's completely out of your control um, and that's going to happen you're going to be disappointed but for every one of those where you get disappointed if you're if you remember that the dartboard is pretty big and you, you know, keep aiming for the whole dartboard uh, every once in a while towards the very outside uh, territory on the dartboard, you get this great piece of business because someone knew someone who knew someone based on someone who you met. Um, and why I tell people it all evens out. What's important is that you keep throwing at the dartboard uh, and don't 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 uh, you know get too upset about when uh, you don't get a, uh, something doesn't come through because there are times where something will come through uh, through a, a lot of luck. But in many ways, because if you keep shooting, you are creating your own luck. All right, so now that you have this contact list, and if you're out there practicing, if you're, if you're tuning in and you're a 20, 30-year lawyer, uh, you should be able to have at least 100. And if you're one of those active people, two, three, four hundred. Not unusual uh, to, uh, you know, to have that many people uh, that you, again, won't want to be contacting. And again, why are you going to be contacting them? Let's get together for lunch or coffee. So again, you've got to contact them. So the question I often get asked is, uh, all right, Roy, what's the best way to contact them? Email or telephone? Well, I have a strong preference uh, via email. First of all, as a practical matter, most people are more comfortable doing that. Uh, but I think there are other more pre uh, other reasons why uh, I recommend email over the telephone. Let's talk about a telephone, and I'll tell you why I don't like it. First of all, when you try to contact somebody via telephone, chances are pretty good you are not going to get them in. Uh, so inevitably, you leave a long, inarticulate voicemail message, or perhaps a message with the receptionist that is not all that uh, great. And, but let's say you do get lucky and you do get that person in. Uh, you think that person is going to pick up the phone and be excited to hear from you? Probably not. What you have probably done is interrupted whatever they are doing, so they may not, may not be all that excited to hear from you and be a little irritated. So already your call is getting off to a slow start. Uh, and then finally, you're getting into, uh, ultimately, at the end of your phone conversation, you're going to be asking the person, hey, what do you say we catch up? Well, you may have fond memories about this person from law school, but their memories about you may not be quite as fond. Uh, in other words, you're putting the person on the spot, and you may not want to do that. Uh, they may want to think about it. So again, I don't, so I'm, these are all the reasons why I don't think phone is, is a good idea. I recognize that there are other, there are so -called, other so-called networking experts out there that will tell you that the phone, you should do the phone, uh, and the primary reasons uh, that many people prefer the phone is, is it's usually harder to say no to somebody on the phone than, uh, than to say uh, no on an email, and I'm not disputing that. I am just saying that I think the pros to email are, are still uh, a better, uh, more, more so than it is for uh, the telephone. So let's talk about email. Why do I like it? Well, again, um, they open it when they want to open it. You're not putting, you're not interrupting anybody. Uh, you're not putting them on the spot to get a chance to think about uh, about it. Um, now, I am certainly well aware that there are people who are going to ignore your emails and the people who ignore your tele telephone messages or voicemails. But I've never seen any. You know, there, there are a lot of people that are rude. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and I've, but I've never seen anything that says that people are you know, ruder in one uh, area versus uh, the other. So again, that's why I prefer uh, the e email. 
you got to be, again, going back to the farmer, you got to be persistent. Uh, well, I, I suggest people actually, when you email them, try three times, three strikes, you're out. Send the first email, like to catch up. Uh, let, what do you say we get together? Uh, then maybe if, the, if you haven't gotten a response, maybe about a week later, if you, uh, in a not so subtle reminder that they ignored you the first time, you forward on the last email. Say, ah, I'm sure you're pretty busy, still interested in catching up. What do you say we get together you know, sometime this month? You know, send that one, and then wait perhaps another two weeks uh, and see if you get a response from that. You probably want, you know, one last time. I know you're real busy again. You spend a short, sweet, and simple. So in all three emails over a three to five week period, there's nothing magic about how much time should be between uh, you know, the, the emails. But then if they don't respond three strikes, uh, you're, you're out or they're out and uh, just move on because they're all not going to respond and it's unrealistic to think they are going to respond um, and when they don't respond or they say no, you know, don't take it personally. Uh, there, there's too many people out there. There are two reasons why um, the vast majority will either ignore your uh, invitation or will say no. They are easy too busy to get together or they are too short-sighted to see the benefits of networking. Move on. Uh, there are hopefully plenty of p uh, people on your list and don't, don't worry about one particular person. Uh, not worth it. If you read any book about sales, they all tell you that not only with the patience and the persistence, they will tell you it is a numbers game. And this goes back to the life of the personality uh, concept that you don't need to be. The successful Networkers, business developers, rainmakers recognize that it's a numbers game. It's getting out of the office, but it's not getting out of the office maybe just once a month or once a week. It's a few times a week. The, the smart rainmakers, the smart rec, uh, networkers recognize that it is a numbers game, and the more people you get to know, and more importantly, the more people get to know what you do and how you can help them, uh, then of course that's how you're going to be uh, successful, uh, you know, networking. So again, it is a numbers game. And then oftentimes I get asked the question, all right, Roy, it's a numbers game. How, what's a good hit rate? Uh, sorry for the baseball metaphors, but we're still in the baseball season. Uh, and I, what I tell people, think about the best baseball players. How often do they get to first base? The best ones bat 300. They're around there. And if you consider walks and errors, they get to base. They, you know, they're approaching more of a 400 uh, average. In other words, three to four times out of 10. So if three to four people out of 10 people that you're contacting get together with you, you're doing very well. If you're doing better than that, hey, you're doing great. Even one or two, it's probably more than one or two more than you have had in a long uh, time. Now, another objection I frequently get from lawyers when I talk about networking is, oh, Roy, this whole networking, this it, it, is somewhat related to the sleaziness aspect. They just kind of look at it as, as very dis, in, disingenuous. People can see through. Everybody knows that the reason why I'm getting together and catching up has nothing to do with catching up. All they want, all they, they realize the only reason why I want to get together with them is the hope to get business. Um, and so I don't want to participate in any activity that's, that's like that. That's not why I went to law school for. Do I agree with that objection? Actually, I do agree that some, you know, that's a lot, oftentimes a lot of people think that way. And uh, but that's the, you know, but I wouldn't worry about that. Why shouldn't you worry about that? Those are the the people who view networking like that are the people who like, will ignore your email uh, or just apply, or you know say no to your invitation. So I wouldn't worry about. The people who are saying yes to your invitation to get together, they know that this is the way the game is played. And yes, it's, it is somewhat of a game. Success is oftentimes based on relationships. It's not necessarily based on merit. Yeah, you got to be a pretty good lawyer, uh, but you got to get go back to the you got to like you know they got to get to know you, like you, and trust you. Uh, and being a good lawyer and is, is, is nothing to do with liking you. And the trust piece, you know, is certainly a piece of that, but not the, not all of it. Uh, so again, don't don't get too wound up about this whole uh, notion that everyone sees through the process. Yes, they, that's the way it is. But hey, those who aren't those people will not be getting together with you. Okay, so when you get together, people, what are you going to have? What do you how do you prepare for these things? Well. Got to be prepared. Who are you getting together with? Those of you trying to get some, uh, you know, business work, you know, go to the website of the company uh, that you are, uh, you know, trying to get, uh, you know, business from. Uh, if it's a personal person, try to, you know, go back in your own mind. What do you remember about that person? Uh, you know, don't spend, you know, five seconds preparing uh, for it. And 
in the types of preparation I'm talking about, all it takes is five or ten minutes. Uh, you know, have an idea of what you want to talk about. Uh, so that you know, and needless to say, you don't have to be you don't have to script the whole thing. I, I don't think that's a good idea, but at least have an idea of the, some of the things you, you you want to be talking about. But again, that shouldn't take you know a lot of a lot of your time to do. When you're having this coffee or lunch, uh, listen. And lawyers have a hard time listening. Uh, and one of the things that uh, was not said in my introduction was I, I part of my I've been a practicing lawyer for 30 years. I was actually an in-house lawyer for about a dozen of those years. And uh, needless to say, I was often invited out to uh, to coffee and lunch with people uh, by a lot of lawyers wanting to get the business from the companies that I was working for. And it, and it never ceased to amaze me how. Uh, the uh, you know the outside lawyers would all they'd be doing was gab 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 gab. Uh, all they wanted to do was talk about themselves, telling me how great they thought they were their law firm. No, it's about the other person. You need to listen. You need to listen. You got two ears, uh, and you got one mouth. Uh, a good networking event, uh, the one on one, you should be listening twice as much as you are talking. And even in uh, even if you're listening 90% of the time, that tends to be a very good. Uh, networking activity. People love to talk about themselves. If they want to talk about themselves, let them go. They're going to walk away with a very warm and fuzzy feeling uh, about you. Again, what's the goal? Go back to the goal. You want these people to like you because uh, they already know you. Now, how are they going to get to like you if you're a good listener and, and, and show attention to what's going on uh, in their life? Again, you need to help these people. That, and how are you going to help these people? It's not simply, hey, if you got this problem, give me a call. If you're going through a divorce, or you can get, you know, arrested. Whatever, whatever the ways you are, your company's getting sued. Yeah, I take a more holistic approach to it. And uh, what do I mean by that? If you hear, if you're listening well, and you learn that the person has young children, and you know they need a babysitter. You give them the names of good babysitters if you know that. I can assure you that person is going to be more grateful for the name of good babysitters than for any legal work that you theoretically uh, may do for them and the person. Or they're doing construction in their house and you know the name of a good plumber. Again, information sharing is, can be very, very valuable to both parties during networking. Remember details. What do I mean by that? Well. I tend to have more senior moments uh, in my day than I care to admit, but even if you're not uh, approaching uh, the 50s or the 60s, even if there are certain things you learn in networking activities that there's no way you are going to remember. And sometimes you just want to remember them the next time you get together, whether it's six months down the road or a year or two down the road. Some of the things that I always, when I'm networking, that I always try to remember, people love to talk about their children. So if you can remember uh, you know, the name, you know, the, the ages, uh, maybe the sexes of their children, something about them. So, for example, uh, off, the people that oftentimes that I know and often networking with, uh, their children are college age. So, inevitably, someone is applying to college or in college. So, if I learn that someone's a senior in high school and they're applying to, you know, a X university and Y university, uh, I will. That's something I will want to remember. So, then a year later, I'll say, Hey, I remember your daughter was a senior and was applying to school. How did that end up? Where did she end up going? How is it working out? So if I'm you know, networking with somebody in September or October, hey, I remember they just went to the, you know, how, how are the first few weeks going? And again, and when I say these details, you don't need to you know, go back and write an auto, you know, a full you know, hour-long script about what you want to remember. One or two things. Another thing that I oftentimes try to remember, if people have a you know, certain kind of vacation plans, again, you can follow up, hey, how was that cruise? I remember you were so excited about talking about that. Again, just one or two things that you know you're probably not going to remember. And you have, hopefully you'll have some sort of system. I have no magic answer of what's the best system to uh, you know, handle all your contacts and information. Outlook can be very helpful, but that's not the only way. You, know, you can do it pencil or paper if you can manage it that way. Uh, but again, that's a way to remember remember all that kind of stuff. And one of the two things I want you all to be aware of that if you you know I don't want anyone to drink any of the Kool Aid I'm trying to feed you now, uh, unless you can be out there networking in a confident and enthusiastic way. Uh, you're wasting your time uh, because people want to hire lawyers that sound like they know what they're doing. Notice how I say they don't have to know what you're doing; you just have to sound like you know what you're doing, and you have to sound like you you're very excited about. Uh, knowing what you're doing. A couple of stories to uh, demonstrate this principle that relate to my individual particular career. Confidence. I started off my career actually in a large law firm doing employment law, and I had no confidence, and I poo-pooed. A lot of the things I've been telling everyone here during this uh, 
during this webcast. One of the reasons why I didn't do it is I felt, why would anyone want to hire Roy Ginsburg at that X amount of money when I don't know what the hell I'm doing in employment law? I lack confidence. But shame on me, because I could have been out there in a confident way uh, if I had spent maybe 30 seconds to a minute thinking about it. How? Hey, I can, you know, I can talk confidently about my law firm. Yeah, I may not know much about employment law yet. I know a little here, a little there, but hey, I work for one, you know, one of the best departments, employment law departments here in the Twin Cities, and uh, you know, you're you're in good hands if you retain me or more my law firm. So again, you can be out there confident, enthusiastic, uh, confident in that way. Enthusiastic. Oh, about ten years ago, I was. Uh, Involved. Some of you may be familiar with the uh, publication Super Lawyers Magazine, the, the rating system. Uh, they are happen to be based in the Twin Cities. They had a big ethics problem years ago, in this, about 10 years ago in the state of New Jersey. Uh, because of the relationship that I had with the publisher, I was retained as essentially acted as a de facto uh, general counsel, in-house attorney managing uh, the ethics mess that was going on in New Jersey. Uh, and they had another other uh, ethics controversy, smaller ones in a variety of other states. Uh, and I was doing that. I had this newer expertise, as I've mentioned, as Stephanie mentioned earlier, in legal marketing ethics. So one of my first jobs that I had to do for, uh, for the publication was find outside lawyers. Uh, in New Jersey. I got a short list from people that I knew locally here in the, in the Twin Cities that knew of, of ways for me to get names in New Jersey. And then I ended up doing a, about you know, three or four phone interviews with, with lawyers. And this was big news in, uh, in New Jersey at the time. Big within, so every, every lawyer in New Jersey that I contacted was very well aware of the case. It was a great case. It was a high profile case. Uh, had a client who could pay, who could afford to pay. First Amendment uh, was basically, you know, no one, everyone would want to, you know, this is the kind of case you would kill to be involved in. So all the lawyers that I interviewed were very, very interested. But one lawyer in particular stood out that I interviewed, uh, and he basically started off, Roy, before you get into your questions, I just want to tell you how embarrassed I am that my, the state where I practice law wants to put your client out of business. Haven't these people, these regulators ever heard of the First Amendment? And then he goes on and on talking about this passion that he has for the First Amendment. Now, of course, I have a passion for the First Amendment. I don't have to tell you what my client, they certainly have a passion for the First Amendment. So the last person that I'm going to want to hire, I don't care if they're, you know, credentialed at Harvard and, you know, clerk for Supreme Court Justice. Uh, is, you know, that super lawyer tie is a little out there, but yeah, I can do a good job for you. You know, I want someone who, who's passionate about it. And so needless to say, you know, I hired the lawyer uh, who, was, who was definitely the most enthusiastic about it. So anyone, if anyone ever tells you that, you know, these softer issues, uh, you know, are, are meaningless, all the outside people care about when retaining counsel, and especially in the corporate world, is, uh, you know, credential, you know, that's a bunch of hooey. Uh, finding good credentialed lawyers, they're a dime a dozen in my opinion, but finding people who are confident, enthusiastic, who you think you're going to be able to work with, again, the softer factors, that's what, that, that's what oftentimes tips the, tips the balance. Uh, so in this particular case, because of this enthusiasm, uh, this law firm ended up getting a few hundred thousand dollars worth of business. And again, it wasn't based on the credentials. All of the ones I talked to had very good uh, credentials. Okay, I did promise to talk about ambulance chasing and solicitation rules. So again, oftentimes some lawyers get a little ahead of the curve and uh, you know get excited at these coffees or lunches and want to ask for the business. Well, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes it's unethical to ask for the business. This is the rule 7.3. Uh, in all of your state rules, and it varies a little in states, but I would have to, if I had a venture to guess, at least 40 of them have very, very similar to the model rule, which is what I'm going to talk about. So needless to say, check your state rules uh, to the most specific, but chances are pretty good your state follows the model rule. And there are basically, there are only four exceptions to the rule there about soliciting. That the person is a lawyer, it's okay to solicit. Okay, so you've got four exceptions. Thou shalt not solicit unless the person is a lawyer. It's a family member. There's a close personal relationship. That's the friend relationship. And then finally, there's a prior professional relationship. And that, that's usually interpreted to mean above and beyond, let's say, a former client, maybe someone who you worked with on a, you know, if you work with a CPA on a case, or you know, something that goes back that's a professional relationship, you can solicit. So that, that's it. And there's no other uh, exceptions to those. So what are the two biggest misunderstandings that a lot of lawyers have uh, regarding this? I'll tell you what the twos are. One is that uh, you know the solicitation rules only apply to hospital emergency rooms, 
No, they do not. They apply to all the big office towers that perhaps some of you live in a major metropolitan area. Uh, it, you know, it belongs there. So in other words, if, if someone on the phone, just because you're making that phone call, solicitation on the phone, you pick up the phone, you read about a company being sued, and you have that person does not fall within any of the four exceptions, just because you're doing it from an office building and not hanging out by the emergency room does not uh, necessarily, you're still violating the rule. It's still unethical. Now, does that go on all the time, or not, not say all the time, but is it, is it is that unusual? No, I know. I'm, I'm very, very realistic about all this. I'm certainly aware that people violate the rule that way. Oftentimes, they don't even realize they're violating the rule, uh, or they realize they're violating the rule and know that it's a practical matter they'll never get caught. Now, I'm not suggesting you do it if you don't get caught, uh, but again, that's a lot of people just don't understand that, that the rule, there's nothing in the rule that says this only applies uh, to people who are literally chasing ambulances. Another exception, another misunderstanding is that uh, people think in Rule 7.3 there's a sophisticated client exception. No, there is not a sophisticated client. Are the rules in t drafted in with the hospital emergency room in mind? Yes, they probably were drafted with that in mind. Uh, but the rule doesn't say anything about that. So again, if the person you're asking the business is a sophisticated client, is a PhD, uh, that doesn't necessarily uh, uh, do anything. The rule still applies. Uh, it applies to someone with a PhD just as much as it applies to someone with a third grade uh, education. The only thing that is uh, relevant are the four exceptions if it doesn't fall within the four exceptions. Okay, it's time now for our last poll question. Uh, and that question is, because again, we're talking about, uh, remember we've had the, the contact list, and I think the challenge, as you know, if only three out of four out of ten will get together with you, you've got to keep adding names to that list. So the best way to add names to that list is, uh, you know, meeting people. How, what are the best ways to meet people? So let's talk about that. And the, what are the best groups to join if you want to meet new people to network with? And the answers are, one, the ABA, state or local bar associations, two, Local community groups, example, the Chamber of Commerce or the Rotary. Three, because of social media, it's a waste of time to join groups now. And finally, it depends on the type of law that you practice. So let's see how you answer the final poll question of the day. Okay, great. And the poll responses are rolling in. If everyone can go ahead and submit their final answers, please. And I'll close it out. Okay, Roy, the results are in. So 8% said the ABA state and local bar associations would be the best group to join. 49%, so definitely our majority there, say local community groups, Chamber of Commerce, and Rotary. And I've never seen this before. 0% said because of social media, it's a waste of time to join groups. So you definitely, definitely put your point across there. And then 43% um, said it depends on the type of law that you practice. So our okay. majority again with those local community groups. Okay, I'm actually a little surprised by the local community groups because the answer, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, is uh, you know the final. It, it really, it, it really depends. Uh, you know, very much so. Um, because certainly the Rotary and Chamber are really good if you're a you know, small community or the, the types of people that hang out there you want to are good potential referral sources uh, or potential clients. But with that said, there are certain types of practices where you, your time is better spent in uh, you know, joining other types of groups. So it's very, very dependent upon not only the law of type, type of law you practice as well as uh, you know, are you a small town lawyer. Uh, or you are a suburban lawyer or metro uh, big, big city. But again, the joining groups are you know, is a tried and true way to, to do this. And if those of you who are unsure of what to join, think about some of your best competitors in your practice area, in your community. Uh, go online, look at their web bios, see what groups they belong to. Chances are if they're very successful, one of the reasons for their success is the groups that they are joining. If you join a group, you've got to become active in it. You know, so one of the things you want to know, do they have a lot of lunches? Do they have a lot of activities? That's where you're going to meet people that to follow up with to have, again, coffee and lunch. That is the ultimate goal of, uh, of, of joining these groups. So when you join these groups, now I'm going to spend you know, about five minutes or so work in the room because that's where everyone gets the sweaty palms. Um, you can read the do's and don'ts. They're pretty obvious. But here are a couple of tips you may not have, may or may not have heard in the past. If you're working a big event, and again, this is remember I talked about the 90% is the one-on-ones. Uh, -on there is the 10% that I know everyone feels comfortable about. 
everyone feels. One, the myth is everyone thinks everyone's having a great time and, and loves going there. I can assure you, most of the people there are, mis are just as miserable as you, and they recognize they need to be there if they want to be successful. Just be thankful you don't have to go to them uh, more than once a month or two or whatever. Uh, so how to meet new people. Uh, if you see someone talking to someone who you already know, you can try to get into that conversation. As uncomfortable as you are, trust me, there are far more people who are more uncomfortable. You can spot them a mile away. You will make a friend if you introduce yourself. I recognize that may be out of the comfort zone for some of you, but hey, if you can do it, go for it. I know this may be counterintuitive for at least some of you. If there's, if there's a happy hour type of event and there's a bar, there's a, a line you have to wait for drinks, get on a long line. You can meet two people comfortably, the person in front of you, the person in back of you. If you're at an event that has a meal, try to, when I'm in an event, I oftentimes am one of the last people to sit myself down at a table. I don't want to sit next to people who I already know. When I'm going to an event, I want to meet new people. And I know when I'm sitting down at a meal, I can meet two new people on the left and the right. Now, will I meet, can I meet everybody? Yeah, it's possible. Depends on the acoustics, what the topic of conversation is. But at a minimum, I know I can comfortably, again, I want to emphasize the word comfortably, meet the person on the left and the person on my right. If you remember, my goal here is to convince you it's in your comfort zone. You can all do that. You can all introduce yourself to the person on the left and your right. Uh, that you're all capable of doing. Same thing holds true for CLEs. You all attend CLEs. You can meet people or you attend conferences. You can always meet people who sit at, you know, don't be one of those people who sits in the last row. Again, you can meet, comfortably meet someone on the left and there's someone at the right if you're attending you know, a, a, a program with breakout sessions. Now, oftentimes when people hear these suggestions, they go, oh, Roy, you know, yeah, that makes a little sense. That's a long shot. What are the chances are that I sit down next to a person at a lunch at this conference that turns out to be a great potential client or referral sources? That's a, that's a long shot. That's a, it's a waste of time. I'm not going to listen to that. And oftentimes I will agree with that person. I say, you know, it is a long shot. But you know what? If you bet long shots, that can be a very good strategy. Uh, but it's only a good strategy if you play a lot of races. So if you know any, if you know how to play the races, in other words, if you go to the racetrack and there are 10 races and you only bet one race and you bet it on a long shot, chances are you're going to go home a loser. But if you go to the racetrack and you bet 10 races and you bet all 10 on long shot, chances are good one or two will come in and you may actually go home a winner. So again, all this works only if you do it consistently. So if you meet every 10 people you meet or 15, you will trust me. I can assure you one at or two of those 10 to 15 will prove to be useful people. Okay, then you're going to have the small talk, and you try to find that something you have in common. Idaho, what a coincidence. Uh, you know, I'm from Idaho. Again, talk about why are you at the, you know, for example, why you, you know, what do you think of the conference? What do you think of this speaker? If you're meeting someone there, uh, why did you join this group? Uh, why, you know, if you're in a chamber group, or, you know, why, what, what's your interest? Again, you have something in common already, oftentimes when you're there at uh, some sort of event. And then inevitably, uh, people ask you what you're going to do. Uh, so what do you do? Ah, I'm a lawyer. The law I do law. I practice law. I am an attorney, something legal. This is what is known as the 30-second elevator speech. Why is it called that? Well, if you meet someone in an elevator, you have about 30 seconds before it opens and they are gone. Uh, try to be a little creative with your elevator speech. I don't have much time to go into a lot of detail, but just for example, don't say you know you're an estate planner or I, I you know, draft trusts and wills. A, an alternative to that is you know I do. I have a lot of rich clients, uh, and uh, they have made a lot of money. And my job is to make sure that you know when they pass on, uh, all the money goes to the people that they want. And I do even more than that. I make sure that Uncle Sam takes the least amount of money. Nothing makes me more excited and thrilled when I have the, my clients come in and sign those papers knowing that everything is taken, has been taken care of. I've been doing this for 20 years and still you know, nothing pleases me more when they walk out of that door. I love doing this stuff. Again, a little bit different than I do estate planning uh, or I draft trusts and wills. Uh, so think about what you tell people when you uh, do. Needless to say, you have different elevator speeches depending on if you're talking to a lay person or another attorney. I did promise a few minutes on social media and only a few minutes. Again, I, think, I look at social media as sort of in a way something that has in some respects replaced maybe one group that you may have joined. 
Uh, so if you love the social media and you're, you know, you're good at it and you enjoy it, you know, by all means do what you can. Meet new people or develop a relationship on all of the uh, you know, popular platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Uh, but just don't overdo it. It's not going to replace the one-on-ones. And really the goal oftentimes is to uh, meet the people through these mediums uh, and uh, you know, follow up with that. And if you're one of the older folks who uh, poo poo a lot of this stuff, I wouldn't necessarily lose too much sleep about it quite yet. Yes, yeah, certainly it can help, uh, you know, in, especially for certain practice areas over another. Uh, but it's still, there's still plenty of other ways to successfully network and market one's practice, even if you completely ignore. Uh, you know, social media. And the one, said, the one thing I would suggest is on LinkedIn, uh, I don't think it's necessarily a very vibrant social media platform, but at a minimum, uh, it's a good way to make sure you have a good profile up there if people want to know more about you. So I would strongly recommend you have good profiles up there and keep it up to date. Uh, so again, that's the only thing about LinkedIn. Twitter, again, you can be thought of as a thought leader. It's not about tweeting about what you ate for lunch or all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it's really not, uh, it's, not, it's not me tweeting, hey, I'm doing this, uh, you know, <coughs> seminar webcast on networking, tune in, uh, aren't I wonderful? It's, no, it's more or less I want people who are listening who maybe who want to be thought of as leaders in business development saying, hey, I'm, you know, listening to Roy Ginsburg doing a seminar on, on networking, good stuff, and then tweeting some of the tips. In other words, so people look to you. Uh, as a thought leader. Again, so you want to be tweeting about things in your practice areas so people will start to follow you uh, as, as far as that. So that's, I think, the most effective way, I think, to uh, utilize social media. Okay, I'm, I'm, lo I'm looking, I want to leave enough time for questions to respond, uh, you know, to that. So I'm going to move on to, uh, you know, my, my last slide, my last portion of the formal presentation, especially in the days when I, even before I was a, you know, a coach, a, an attorney coach, uh, when I was an in-house attorney, oftentimes a lot of outside lawyers would come to me and say, hey, Roy, you know, you're hiring lawyers all the time. You hang out with a lot of in-house lawyers. You know what goes on in their mind. Uh, you know, what, what's the secret sauce? What's the magic formula uh, you know, to getting hired? Uh, and I actually had a very, very simple response that, you know, sometimes surprised uh, the lawyers on the other end. I, I hired people who I liked. It's really that simple. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over, uh, you know, to Stephanie. Great. Thank you, Roy. Thank you so much, really. Those were some great tips. And we did set, get some great questions, which I'll get to in just a moment. Um, but for those of you who have to leave us now, please take note of three things. Um, my case offers a 30-day free trial, and because you attended this webinar today, you get this bonus discount. So note that promo code, 10ROY15, and you'll get 10% off your first six months of my case. So that's a great deal. Secondly, when you close your webinar, a five-question survey will pop up. Please take a quick moment to answer these survey questions. And for more incentive to do so, we'll randomly select a one lucky survey responder to receive a $50 Amazon gift card. So it's worth your while. And also you'll receive an email tomorrow with a link to our blog where you'll find these slides, the webinar recording, and the Amazon gift card winner. Uh, okay, so now we're ready for some of these great questions. And Roy, this goes back to your create a contact list slide. Um, because you briefly touched on social media. People want to know about um, getting in touch with contacts from LinkedIn um, to kind of get that first meeting. What's your advice there? Okay, no. Um, I actually, the LinkedIn can be very effective. What I call, you know, I remember I mentioned earlier, I don't believe in cold calling, but I would, you can do a lukewarm, what I call a lukewarm, you know, contact. Again, one effective way LinkedIn is to add to your contact list. If you want to get, you want to know who are the alumni. Uh, I know there's a way to uh, very uh, a, a way to use LinkedIn to figure out where they where are all the alumni from my college or all the alumni from my law school, and then you may see then based on them who they're connected with that you're connected with. So again, you can get lukewarm introductions or just use that as a way uh, that it's not necessarily out of, out of nowhere. Uh, and I think LinkedIn is the best platform uh, to be able to utilize it in that way to enhance the contact list. It's still usually more going to be more effective and more likely people will get together with you when there's more of a connection uh, than something that you found, you know, that uh, you really don't know them, but you know they went to your law school. Uh, 
but that but it can be you know but it's, it's it's even more effective of course if you are late you know the same people the problem with linkedin is sometimes people have so many connections you really don't know how well they know that person that they're connected with yeah that makes a lot of sense um Okay, moving on to the next question. Can you please address how to deal with potential clients who you know already, but they also have a long-standing relationship with your competitors? Okay, um, good question. Uh, one of the things that I uh, did when I was more in private practice, uh, you know, you ask them what, what, how are things going with the lawyers? What, is, you know, what, what do you like about them? What do you dislike about them? Uh, I think, I think for the most part, it does. It makes it's going to be viewed very negatively if you, uh, you know are more aggressive than that. Uh, recognize that sometimes you want to be number two. First of all, you need to be, I want to go back to the two P's, patience and persistence. Sometimes there are conflicts that come up, so you may be, you want to be number uh, two on the list, so you get that call when there's a conflict. And there's not as much loyalty these days. People mess up cases or different relationships come in. Uh, the p decision makers change. Uh, so I would not be aggressively try to sell, just you stay in touch, and instead of you know some other more potential clients that uh, you may want to stay in contact with, maybe let's say once a year, those kind of people where you know they're entrenched maybe every other year. Uh, but I still think you want to keep them on the radar screen because you never know what's going to happen. Okay, very nice. And a couple of people just wanted some clarifications for when you can ask for the business. Is it pretty much if you knew them prior to an event or an incident, it's okay to ask for it, but if you didn't, don't try? Well, it can. If it's family, friend, lawyer, private, professional relationship, if you just if you met them, uh, you know, if you met them at an event a week later and then you have lunch with them, that's not in my view, uh, and I think most regulators view a private professional relationship. It needs to be more than that. Uh, so another, and the same thing with a friend. Uh, you know, it's got to be not someone who you went to college with 30 years ago and you were friends, you were in the same fraternity, but you never really close friends. I doubt a regulator is going to fall for that either. And if you're looking for you know reported decisions about this stuff, it's just not out there. It's basically, you know, common sense. Again, they, they don't want the, the rule, the idea behind the rules, they don't want you soliciting people that you really do, know nothing about. Uh, okay, got it. Um, I'm going to read you a question that, that just came in. Um, what are some ways young lawyers can add value to the Rainmaker partner to make the lunch or coffee mutually beneficial? Well, I'm not sure what they mean by the Rainmaker partner. Um, Maybe I mean, the person if, who yeah, in. I mean, if you're out there, if you, I mean, would the, uh, I'm going to change that question a little bit. What I think it is intended is, uh, you know, if I'm a young lawyer, what, uh, or if I'm just networking, what can I offer to people? Because I know I'm not doing much. Uh, again, you talk about your law firm, as I kind of mentioned earlier in my, in my day, that I did not uh, do. One of the things that, uh, when I go back to uh, talking about networking is about mutual assistance. So, you know, oftentimes, uh, especially people when they're networking, let's say for a job, they say, "What? The, you know, I, I'm a new graduate. I can't help these people." Well, you'd be surprised uh, that you know, you may have information that may be able to help. You may be able to make an introduction, uh, and it goes back to like the babysitter, you know, contractor uh, the types of things that you may be able to help people out that way. It's not just about uh, you know what? How can I? How can I possibly you know be helping these people uh, when I don't know what I'm doing? Uh, you you do know more and, and have, know people or have some information than you give yourself credit for. Okay, great. Um, very confident boosting. Thank you, Roy. And a couple people asked about they just moved to a new area or community. Um, what would you say is the number one way to get out there and start networking? If you're new to town. Well, I'll give the two word answers we all love to give to our clients. It depends. Again, if, uh, it's, I'm going to give you a different answer if you're you know, moving to Philadelphia as opposed to if you're moving to a you know, small town in, uh, in Pennsylvania, for example. Uh, in a small town, you, you know, you, if you, and you're going after uh, you know, actually any type of work, you probably want to look into a chamber or a rotary or something like that. Or depending on your religious affiliation, you want to get involved uh, you know, there. Uh, again, and get, get to, you know, to meet people. If you're moving to a bigger metropolitan area, again, you got to figure out who you want to hang out with and, and get to know and meet. 
So if you're moving to a big area, you're going to want to focus in. You know, and I know there are chambers, smaller chambers and smaller rotaries, so that still makes sense. Uh, on the other hand, depending on the practice area, there may be other types of you know, trade groups or other types of community organizations uh, that may just be you know, unique to that particular area. You've got to ask around. Ask other lawyers. See what other lawyers belong to. Again, there are no secrets. With the web, there are no secrets out there. Um, so just see what other people uh, are joining. Chances are if they're joining it, there's a good chance that you should be joining it too. Okay, excellent, Ryan. Thank you so much. You got through uh, a lot of questions there. And I think we're going to wrap it from here. I want to thank everyone for joining us today and Roy for a fantastic presentation. Thank you. I want to thank everyone else for uh, attending. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>